All right, well, let's respect one another and respect the time. And guess what? The county executive and the councilwoman will stay here all night, but us poor staffers will be getting yelled at. So please don't get us yelled at because we have to be the ones that really be my, uh, that are mindful of the time. So be respectful of one another. Again, our neighborhood outreach team, and I'm about to introduce Ms. Debbie Risper, who manages the outreach team, and they are gonna get, some of you are gonna have handouts I know we've seen. Um, they're gonna take that from you, and they're gonna follow up with you. So a quick synopsis of what your issue, concern, or praise, I know most people are here to say thank you guys for working in government. I know this is y'all here to say <laughs> But anyway, so without further ado, Ms. Debbie Risper. And thank you for being here. My name is Debbie Risper, and I have the awesome responsibility overseeing community engagement. What starts here with each of you, we want to connect and strengthen the ties between Baltimore County government and our phenomenal community. Thank you, and please. Oh, my team. <laughs> I'm looking through the crowd and they're in the back waving, but they'll be in and out. Up in the Marie too. Anne Marie. We have Anne Marie, Nancy, Mary, Michelle, and Brad, who is your direct MP, who is your direct Brad is your direct contact for this district. But all of us are here tonight to serve you. All right, so we're about ready to start this party off. But again, just want to remind everybody, if you want to start lining up, there's going to be a presentation first by the county executive, and then we're going to take questions. And uh, again, I, we were in Essex last week, and I'm going to be honest with you, that's been my favorite crowd so far. They, they, they all listen. But I think that y'all are going to be better. I think y'all are going to be better tonight. So again, we obviously want to hear from you, but we want to be respectful of one another. So I'm going to turn it over to the county executive and councilwoman, and uh, we'll get started. And I'll have some remarks later to keep people on task. All right? And if you're a repeat offender, because I've seen a couple of you in there, <laughs> just be mindful that this is for this community and be around that two-minute mark. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Councilwoman Kathy Bevins, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening. I especially want to thank Principal Patessa for having us here uh, this evening and um, you know great principals make great teachers who educate our children and you're doing a wonderful job here thank you for hosting uh, this event for us this is the very center of the sixth district that's why I picked the location here um, I want to thank you all for coming out and um, be willing to you're all going to leave, leave here tonight with a lot of knowledge because the county executive is making his rounds around all of Baltimore County and each one of the councilmatic districts going over his presentation. So everybody here tonight is gonna to leave with more information um, than when they came in. So without further ado, I'd like everybody to give a warm welcome to our County Executive, John Oshesky. I have a few people. Uh, there's also some other elected officials here and some representatives. Um, I want to represent Mark Kennedy. He is here representing Senator Chris Van Hollen, as you can see. I'd like to acknowledge Renee Smith, who is here representing Senator Kathy Klausmeyer. Carl Jackson. Where are you, Carl? Right here. Representing Delegate Eric Cromwell. We have Lily Rowe from the school board here with us this evening. And also George White from the Democratic Central Committee. Thank you. Everyone. Now here's John. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Bevins. It is an honor to be here with you, District Six, with so many of your constituents tonight. Um, thank you again to Principal Protestas for for hosting us. Um, as TJ said, we're we're here to listen mostly tonight. Um, I do have a brief presentation to look forward to running through with you, but this is about this is about District Six, and this is about the residents of Baltimore County. And so I'm so grateful that. Councilwoman Bevins and her colleagues on the council have partnered with me as we've developed this town hall series to both give you some tough truths that we're confronting, but also to listen to you about what your what your priorities are. So as soon as this presentation is done, the floor is yours. 
so tonight's a conversation about our priorities and what, what we're going to be doing together in the years ahead. And like many of you, like Councilwoman Evans, I am committed to making a good county better. And that means making smart investments in our schools and our communities. That's the what. But the what is just one piece of it. The how matters too. And how talks about process. Um, it's about making government more accessible, more transparent, more connected, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, over the past two years, if you've been at a prior event or you've heard me before, you don't answer this question, but does anyone know over the past two years how many people testified on the Baltimore County budget? We have 835,000 people, yeah. Two people in the last two years testified. There were two people last year, one of whom I believe is in the room tonight, and the prior year, there were no people who testified on the county budget. So um, the fact that this, this town hall tonight um, speaks volumes, and we're going to shatter those records just in this room the same way we've shattered records at every town hall we've had um, throughout Baltimore County. In addition to engaging this way before we develop our budget, um, we're going to also post more information than ever before online so that you can be an active participant in this process. You know, a budget is the most important expression of our values. It says who we are, um, the kind of county we want to be in. So before we talk about hearing about your priorities in the budget, let's talk a little bit about basics of where we are in the budgeting process. So let's start with your money and where our, where our finances actually come from. So we're currently in fiscal year 2019, which runs from July 1st to June 30th of 2019. Um, and in the current fiscal year, uh, we're expected to take in 3.6 billion. Um, three quarters of which comes from your property tax, the income tax, and state aid. We also bring in money from things like fees and permits on restaurant inspections, federal aid on transportation and education, and then there are also service taxes, like hotel, motels, and public service. Just for perspective, um, the 27% of which comes from property taxes, just under a billion dollars, that's $1.10 for every $100 of assessed value in your property. And the current income tax rate is 2.83% here in Baltimore County, accounting for about $750 billion of our, of our revenue. That's, and, and again, there are two um, budgets. We're first talking about the operating budget, which is sort of our, our year to year. We'll talk next about our capital budget, which is more of sort of our building fund, uh, which is sort of the way I think about it. Um, also on the, 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 the um, operating side, so let's talk about where we spend that money um, year over year. Um, nearly half, unsurprisingly, of our operating budget goes to our schools. Um, and I believe, and I know that the council believes, education is really the best tool we have for creating opportunity and generating economic mobility. After education, our most, um, our biggest investments are public works and public safety. There's a uh, black non-departmental slice for about $285 million, that 8% number. Uh, that's things like health insurance for employees and, and pension benefits for retired teachers, first responders. Um, I also would point out at this point, because it will come up later in relationship to the capital budget or our building fund, the slice right next to it, that purple slice, is something called debt service. It's 4%, it's about $127 million this year. That's money that we actually put back into the operating fund, the year-over-year -year fund, to pay down the borrowing we do on our, on our capital budget or on our building fund. So that's the operating side. Let's talk about the capital side. The two biggest sources of our capital funding come from something called general obligation funds. Now this is something you'll see every two years on your general election November ballot. Uh, and we pay those back from the general fund through the thing called debt service. And as I just said, $127 million of our current operating fund is used to pay down debt that was taken out in the past. Uh, we also have a, a lot of our money comes from what's called metro district funds, and those are bonds that are repaid from revenue on water and sewer fees. That fund is, a, is what's called a self-sustaining and a self-supporting fund. So the, the money from water and sewer are paid sort of a match to the debt that's taken out to do our infrastructure investments. So unsurprisingly, when we talk about where that money goes, the largest amount of capital dollars goes on the water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, the next biggest portion, again, unsurprisingly, is spent on our school buildings, um, including renovating existing schools and building new ones. So that's a good snapshot of where our money gets spent, um, but it only tells a part of the story. So I want to spend just a few minutes walking through some of the major challenges that we're facing in the context of that budget. 
Um, over the past 10 years, um, we're in year eight of a Schools for the Future program, which is a $1.6 billion school renovation and construction program that was meant to alleviate overcrowding in our elementary schools, modernize schools in the greatest need, and install central air conditioning across all of Baltimore County schools. Since it was launched in 2011, there have been 59 schools air conditioned, 16 new schools built, and 12 additions. Here in the 6th district, um, that equated to the addition of air conditioning at 10 schools, uh, the new Victoryville Elementary School. Um, and so the listing of all the air conditioning is there in addition to the new replacement school at Victory Villa. So it's important to remember though that that work isn't done. Uh, there are still six projects currently underway with another eight that haven't been started yet. They're still in planning and design. To finish this program, Baltimore County still has to come up with another $600 million. Now bear in mind that the state gives Baltimore County about $45 million in any given year to help us with our capital project. It's a 50-50 match um, it's in terms of we put up half and the state puts up half. But to stay on the schedule that's been laid out by this uh, aggressive Schools for the Future program, which was definitely needed and long overdue, we actually have more needs. Um, the prior administration um, set out a, a, a process where to actually do all this, the county would have to pay not just our county share, but also pay the state share um, in advance and hope that the state would be able to pay us back. Now, what I've come to learn since becoming county executive is we simply don't have the resources to, to front the state share. Um, and so in slowing that process down to have it be under sort of status quo, we match dollar for dollar with the state as they have been doing, we actually would have to decelerate the program um, instead of finishing all of the schools remaining in fiscal 2022, we'd have to push out those programs over the course of four years. So that's four years later that communities were expecting. And what that means in practice is that a number of projects, including all along the Northeast Corridor, at places like Red House Run Elementary School um, and the new elementary school at Ridge Road, would be delayed. Um, so what I've done is I've gone to Annapolis, I've talked to the governor, I've talked to the speaker of the house, the, the senate president, our county delegation, and we've advocated for the county to receive a $100 million a year commitment over the next five years. So the state basically steps up and says we will meet our portion um, with the accelerated program that you're trying to implement. We're not asking for any special favors, we're just asking the state to put forward their half of that school construction money give us a guarantee that it will be there so that we can continue to move forward in a fiscally responsible way. Um, once we finish, and we'll talk about this later, once we finish that Schools for the Future program, this will come up later, uh, we can actually start talking about planning and design and construction for our high schools, which are also needed across Baltimore County. But in addition to Schools for Our Future, Baltimore County also has a responsibility to pay um, health and life insurance benefits after we have employees retire. Um, and we have a, an obligation to make sure that there's a fund that's solvent to make sure we can actually provide those, those needs. Uh, but for the past several years, the county actually has not been funding it, um, even at the rate at which we're paying out benefits. And so as it stands now, we have a fund that has $385 million in assets, but more than $1.9 billion of liabilities that are projected out over the next few years. If the county doesn't start making project, making contributions, this fund is actually going to be out of money in fiscal 2023. Now what that means is, sure, we can, we can draw down on the 385 million, but that'll be gone in two years. And, and we'll have $125 million a year of liability moving forward that's not currently being accounted for. So pretty significant challenges there. Um, on the environmental front, uh, Baltimore County entered into an environmental consent decree um, dealing with uh, dumping raw sewage into the seam, streams, creeks, and rivers that flow into the Chesapeake Bay, obviously important to people here in eastern Baltimore County. It requires us to clean up our watershed. In 2018, we borrowed $268 million to invest in wastewater treatment. Um, over the next several years, we have uh, programmed out nearly $700 million of additional borrowing to continue complying with the requirements of that consent decree. Uh, we also borrowed, um, we were also under federal law required to adopt practices that reduce um, polluted runoff into the bay. Um, that's a 
may remember conversations about stormwater. Um, there, is a, there was a, a piece of legislation that had um, con contributed about $24 million a year to the county coffers to help pay for some of that. Um, since that law was repealed, um, we've actually used our metro funds that usually help support water and sewer to cover the cost of what was being supported by stormwater. Uh, it's still an unmet need. We have a 2025 deadline for our, all of our permitting needs, so we have to continue to invest money there to support our requirements. So in the context of all that, we've actually tried to really constrain in Baltimore County our spending um, on, the, on the county government side. And so over the past three decades, um, we've actually grown pretty considerably by 20% um, in population. At the same time, we've actually reduced uh, general government workforce by almost 25%. Um, and, and really prioritize investment in our people in public safety and our public schools. So 77%, almost eight out of every 10 county employees works in either public safety or public education. So this is, this is sort of the, the sobering reality that I inherited when I walked in. And where does all of these numbers leave us? Um, as we're preparing our budget for next year, the fiscal 2020 budget, we have a current budget that's in balance, but next year's budget is already $81 million um, out of whack. And that's basically meeting mostly our contractual and legal obligations. It includes a small down payment on those OPEB liabilities, which actually doesn't even cover next year's projected cost. Um, and so that gap actually only grows in future years without changes. So we do have a fund balance that we're required to maintain. Um, the council actually has required me to have it at 10%. It actually has been drawn down to about that level now. Um, so the only way to balance the budget, um, as this chart says, would be to draw that down. Now, in addition to not being able to because of the law, uh, we know that's not sustainable. It would be like a family drawing on their 401k or their family savings to bridge the gap, and that's not gonna work. So if we continued on the path, the county would be entirely out of money, no OPEB, no, um, fund balance, and we'd have a structural deficit um, in the years ahead. That's why the county's been, you may have read about this um, watch list for our bond ratings and being downgraded. Um, rating agencies who look at these trends and these numbers um, have indicated that the county has to take action to get our fiscal house in order. And what's really scary about those forecasts um, is that they only account for what's, again, currently budgeted, what we know is a cost. They don't address the needs for new high schools. They don't address the needs for things like teacher pay raises that we've heard a lot about in the news. They don't address pre-K expansions. They don't address anything, quite frankly, that's in one of the budgets that's before the Board of Education currently um, that would actually, the original fiscal 2020 um, request given to the Board of Ed was $91 million above maintenance of effort. So that $91 million, if that came to me for a request, that would be the 81 plus 91. So just to put it in perspective, if the school board requests that, we would be, and if it were funded, we would be $170 million short. So that's, obviously there are things beyond the school system uh, needs that we need to do to make our county better, um, but one of those things we have to do is find a way to move forward on our high schools. Uh, we are facing a capacity crisis here in Baltimore County. There are going to be, over the next decade, 1,700 seats um, needed more than there are actual um, seats in our classroom. So several high schools are going to have to be replaced. Others will require significant modernizations. Um, so the SAGE policy group came in and envisioned several scenarios, uh, many of which cost somewhere in the ballpark of $600 million. Again, money that's not currently programmed or accounted for. Uh, we also have capital needs in our roads and sidewalks. We're currently Program to do $43 million over the next three years. As we travel, we hear the need to do even more than that. People want their roads repaved. They want sidewalks put in. Uh, we have committed money to upgrade our 911 system. And then we've, we are in, in process and have to finish our commitment to the Health Professionals Building over on the CCBC Essex campus. Now, I don't think anyone would look at most of these things and say these are frivolous. These are important investments for our residents. So in addition to the infrastructure, we talked about people. And one of the things we talked about is how do we find a way to pay our teachers more? Uh, it's something that's very important to me. Um, the average salary in Baltimore County is less than all but two of the big counties in the 
in the Big Seven in Maryland. If you look all the way to the left, you see that Montgomery County and Howard County actually have the two highest teacher salaries. Um, interesting connection. They also have two of the best school systems in the state. Um, we're, we're less than the state average, and uh, you know, we want to do more for our teachers here. They work hard for us day in and day out. Um, I also am a firm believer um, we have over 2,000 students who are actually by MSDE's own uh, guidelines or economic, uh, through an economic eligibility lens are currently eligible or should be eligible for pre-K in Baltimore County, and we don't provide it. Uh, but I want to do more to make sure our kids have more access to quality early childhood education. We know that research has found that they have higher earnings, they commit fewer crimes, they're more likely to have a job, and they're more likely to graduate from high school than a student who doesn't have access to pre-K and quality early childhood education. Um, I want to do more, and we've talked about on the front end of education, but there's also the back end of education. How do we make our community colleges more accessible to all of our residents, our recent high school graduates, our displaced GM workers who are going to be looking for work, um, using things like the College Promise to really make this opportunity more available um, for our residents is really important. And we know that investment in higher education works. And in CCBC, 95% of all graduates from CCBC stay in the Baltimore region, and on average they earn $10,000 more a year than the average graduate <coughs> from high school. <coughs> In addition to education, there are any number of other areas where we need to invest more. We've heard a lot about the needs to address the opioid crisis and epidemic. I know that Senator Klausmeyer and Delegate Bromwell have been leaders in the General Assembly on this issue. Uh, we have to do more here in Baltimore County. We have the second highest rate of overdose deaths in the entire state of Maryland. Um, we have to do more for our environment and sustainability. We have 232 miles of shoreline here. Um, for all of you who have dealt with the record rainfall and the flooding issues, we have to build more resiliency for our communities and make sure that we actually are building up our, our neighborhoods. Uh, we have housing obligations. There's a legal agreement to do more uh, affordable housing in Baltimore County. We've heard consistently from people about our rec and parks programs, having more access to vibrant parks, um, recreational opportunities, We've heard more about transportation requests, bike lanes, walkability, making our neighborhoods more pedestrian friendly. Again, these are all things that I am strongly supportive of, but trying to work with the community, with the council, to find a way to fund our priorities in a way that's also fiscally responsible. So, um, on day one, um, I decided that I knew we were gonna have some challenges, so we established a, a budget commission. It was the first action I took, it was an executive order. Uh, I charged that group to take a look top to bottom. Uh, I know that most organizations benefit from an outside eye. I think government is no exception to that. Uh, my guess is that commission will give us as much bad news as they give us good news, but I think it's really important that we just put everything on the table and have an honest conversation about where we are and what the choices are. I've also issued, uh, or will be issuing shortly, an RFI uh, for a countywide performance audit to find out if there are any places whatsoever uh, we can determine if there are any places for increased efficiency. Um, last week, I announced a proposal to create an independent office of ethics and accountability so that it's separate from me, it's separate from the council. If there are any concerns about waste, fraud, or abuse, people have an opportunity to call that person in that office um, and, and have them investigated, regardless of where they come from. Um, we'll make sure that there's no employee there's no county resident who has any fear of coming forward um, for fear of retribution. So we take it seriously. We want you to know that every penny we take, we take and spend, is being spent responsibly. So I'm looking forward to that. In addition, uh, long term, uh, I'm looking at creating a performance management system. You know, Baltimore City launched CityStat, and they were considered ahead of the curve. It's 20 years later, and we still have no sort of performance management system of our own, so quite frankly, we're behind the curve, and that's one of the things I want to do. Uh, we also leave a lot of money on the table. We don't partner as effectively and aggressively as we should with the private sector, with nonprofits, and pursuing grants from the federal and state government. Um, moving forward, I've already tasked our department heads to prepare for a budget um, with no new revenue um, and identify what that means, so that we can be honest um, with the public. I've tasked them to identify programs that no longer um, 
meet their, their stated purpose needs and they have outlived their purpose, to collaborate with each other, to find redundancies, and to look at every nickel we spend to eliminate programs that aren't core to our mission or that aren't achieving their purpose. <clears throat> so these conversations are important because they're helping to inform our budget that has to be presented to Councilwoman Bevins and the council by April 15th. Um, this is an important part where you come into the process. Uh, I hope that you will continue to send ideas to us at ideas at baltimorecountymd.gov. Uh, we've already taken some of the ideas and we're looking at them very seriously in this budgeting process. Uh, I also want to say a lot of what happens in Annapolis over the next 90 days will impact our ability to do more in our schools. So please encourage, please reach out to your local representatives in the legislature. Uh, they're fighting for that for us, and please let them know that you have their back. And uh, you know, this is about being fiscally responsible and forward thinking. It's about investing in our communities and being responsible with your money. So. Um, to do that, I think it's about having honest conversations that these town halls are about. It's about engaging, it's about partnering, it's about listening to you. So um, with that, we're going to turn the floor back over to you after TJ has just a few more announcements and reminders. But I know I speak for the council when we say we're both very excited to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns about the county. Um, we will have a member of our outreach team uh, collect your information so you get a personal follow-up. And then we will work with you to make sure any issues you raise are followed up with. Address. So, thank you. All right, uh, outreach staff, would you want to raise your hands one more time? If you look around, uh, these are the people that are going to be tapping you on your shoulder. And what we would ask is if you can state your name when you uh, come up to the microphone. There are microphones on both sides. So, if you want to line up, see more people on this side than that side, we'll alternate sides. And uh, again, if you don't mind silencing your cell phones, unless, of course, somebody goes too long, turn your cell phone up real loud. Uh, but uh, we're going to turn it over to you guys, and we will start over here with the first comment. Again, let's try to stay around two minutes, please, or less. Hello. My name is Kate Lynn Daniels. I'm the president of the Overly Community Association. Thanks for being here tonight. I proudly represent Overly, and um, we're home to a diverse community of three, 1,300 homes, many of which are beautiful Victorians, and we deliver, hand deliver a community newsletter to every single one of our homes um, four times a year. We have an active, vibrant community board with 10 members, and we have an active community on patrol program. Our community is engaged, inclusive, and solution-driven, and we pride ourselves on showing the world what a great little place we are. I invite you, please, um, to come to Overly and see all we have to offer. I know Kathy has made her way over for our farmer's market. County Executive, I'm here tonight to ask for your help. The state of Maryland started a revitalization of Beller Road Route 1 from the city line to the Beltway Exchange. Two phases were completed, design and land acquisition, but Millions of taxpayer dollars were spent on the state, and then the state stopped the final phase, construction, the, completement, the completion of the road revitalization. I'm here tonight to ask that you be our ally and speak, um, speak for us, the Maryland State Department of Transportation, the governor, and decision makers to see the completion of our road revitalization. Um, thank you very much for being here, and can I count on your support on this measure? Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, and yes. Um, and Brad will also follow up. Um, he's our District 6, I think, I think he's in your catchment area, so he will make sure that he goes to a meeting and make sure, make sure that I'm there as well, too. We can talk more about the project. So thanks for your leadership and your advocacy. My name is Janice Severo Dushinsko. I'm a new resident with uh, Baltimore in Baltimore County, um, and I'm also a member of Prevent Nuclear War Maryland. Um, on August 6th, uh, Baltimore City Council unanimously voted to uh, pass the resolution back from the brink, which is a call to prevent nuclear war. Uh, the next day, the city of Los Angeles and the state of California uh, became, uh, the, the state of California became the first state in the U.S. to pass this resolution. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, so that's basically what I'm asking uh, the uh, Baltimore County Council to consider this back from the brink. Uh, it has five parts, and um, 
you can look up information on that from the brink as well as uh, prevent nuclear war, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wayne Gemmel. I'm a small landlord. Thank you. I'm a small landlord. Um, you're under a, there's a federal consent order that requires legislation to be put forward uh, regarding um, accepting vouchers from Section 8. Uh, I oppose that. I don't want to have to deal with the bureaucracy of Section 8. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have a problem. We've got one bird into our peninsula, one bird out, and three full 